Hello, everyone. I'm Tina Madison, and with me I have uh, Judge Kathleen Quigley and Stacy Brady. We are from Pima County Juvenile Court in Tucson, Arizona. And um, I just want to make an announcement that while this is a pre recorded session, in the comment, there is a comment section uh, halfway down the page on the right. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to just jump in and ask us. Um, but let's get started. Hi. Good, um, good morning or afternoon. I'm not sure which. Uh, my name is uh, Kathleen Quigley, and I am a judge in Pima County uh, in Tucson, Arizona. And we're sharing today with you our Dependency Alternative Program, or as we like to call it, DAP, D-A-P. Um, one thing that we'd like to preface before we begin our presentation is that we understand that every county, every state, every district is different. Um, how, how you handle things. And just to give you just a brief overview, in our county, our superior court uh, is downtown, but our juvenile court is in a separate location. And not only are we in a separate location, but our clerk's office has a downtown version, and then they have a juvenile clerk's office that's housed at our facility. We have 13 judges in our juvenile court. We handle dependencies, delinquencies, adoptions, and title, uh, we have guardianships, permanent guardianships that we handle here at court along with some other matters. So that just gives you an overview of what our court looks like. When we're talking about dependencies, um, I know that pretty much that dependencies maybe look a little bit different in every state. The departments are, have different names, the Department of Child Safety, the process may differ somewhat, our timelines may differ depending on the, the county or the state where you're in. The names of the agencies, the hearing types may have a little different name. Um, but what isn't different is that they're all resource intensive. Dependencies are resource intensive cases all the way from the department's uh, in investigation in the case to writing reports to coming into the court to filing petitions to the clerks the attorneys um, it's it, it's intensive in dollars intensive in time and the impact on the families as we know is not always a positive impact even though the intention is to do to do positive things for the families and help them reunify and get back together it may not always have that effect on them so we think that that's one thing that we think why DAP has a really broad appeal is because um, this does change some things for, for families and can improve some of those resource intensive outcomes as well as the negative impacts. The Dependency Alternative Program, when we designed it, we had certain goals in mind. The first thing was we wanted to have dependency actions um, prevented when a legal alternative was available and we wanted to keep the family out of the dependency system for a year. Our goal was for this not to be a band-aid, not to provide a short-term resolution that would only result in the family coming back later to court. And we wanted to make sure that um, if this, the DAP is not a situation where a family wants to reunify and services had to be in place, that truly is a dependency and needed to be in the court system. And this program um, is not intended to be a free legal, legal clinic for families. It was a way to put protective family orders in place uh, by changing custody, by uh, giving people to have the ability to access the superior court and uh, when they, um, superior court to make sure that that happened. So we want to first share some ideas from you about some of the case scenarios that we have. So, Essentially, uh, I'm going to refer you to the handout that we provided you that gives a lot of different case scenarios that have come into play. It's if a parent's unsafe or both parents are unsafe, there may be a, a, another alternative for those children to be safe and not have a dependency. We have had very sad cases where there's a parent who's terminally ill and they've not made arrangements on how to care for the children or a parent's deceased and a parent may be missing, a parent's incarcerated, another parent's missing or successor guardianship cases. In DAP cases, I'll give you one example that we had um, just to help you sort of understand the process. We had this one young man, he was a teenager. He had been actually in Washington State in a dependency case with his mom. And it was not a very good situation for him and it was really difficult. He'd been removed from his mother before he could reunify. Ultimately, he was reunified with his mother through that dependency case, but his mother passed away. He came to Arizona to live with his father, and while he was here, his father passed away. And all of a sudden, he had no parent. He wanted to live with a, uh, a, 
a family friend that was there with them um, that he knew the boy from high school and the his friend's father tried to file the dependency petition or excuse me uh, filed for guardianship downtown in our family law court but he was unable to do so because he didn't have the money the man living penny to penny paycheck to paycheck did not know how to ask for a waiver of fine of fees for filing of the guardianship downtown so he was at a loss the uh, family or uh, the young man came to the attention of the Department of Child Safety and the Department of Child Safety was going to remove him and place him in a foster home or place find him a place to be but through our DAP program we were able to bring them into court we were able to take care of the paperwork for them and we were able to initiate an, a, a guardianship for them through um, through our DAP orders and that little boy when they came into court and we ordered the guardianship take place it was like an adoption that young man was so afraid of being in the department's care, so afraid of being involved in another dependency, that this made it a happy, happy day for them. And I don't think we get to see as much happiness in our in those types of cases for us at the court. So that was a really positive outcome for us. Um, and so, you know, sometimes we have a case where there's one one child involved in dependency. The parent has another child that is not yet in the dependency system or has another child, but that the uh, other parent of that child is appropriate. We don't always have to bring that child into the dependency because we're able to take care of for the family, some family at law orders to take care of that. So this um, DAP has provided us some alternatives and ways to keep these families out of the dependency system when safe and appropriate for the child. How we came to the dependency alternative program initially was that when we were looking at it was that first we wanted to look at dependency petitions and in 2014 we started this back this dependency alternative program back in 2014 and first began looking at it we did a deep dive and took 20 percent of and looked at our cases and found out that 20 percent of our cases of the 1351 dependency petitions that were uh, filed were dismissed pre-adjudication. And when we looked deeply at those cases, in 90% of those cases, um, they were dismissed pre-adjudication. But what happens is, as you all know, is that's still time and it, time intensive and costly. In a dependency case that was dismissed um, pre-adjudication, we can go to the next slide, took an average of 141 days to 682 days to be resolved and dismissed pre-adjudication. And that was really difficult. And so, uh, or 180, 141 cases of dismissed pre-adjudication and 682 cases of dismissed post-adjudication after reunification. Our DAP cases last an average of seven days from referral. And that's from when we received the first phone call to when the case is actually set for a hearing and a DAP hearing takes half of a day. The next case is the slides to show you the dependency process. And as I discussed before, you know, it looks different in every case, but this kind of shows you what it looks like in Arizona and where that red arrow is, is how long it took and what you had to go through to get to a pre-adjudication dismissal, whereas a DAP case is seven days. And this just shows you how labor intensive, how cost intensive and resource intensive that a dependency case is. Um, the next thing that we want to show you is, is that, as I talked about, pre-adjudication dismissal is costly. And the other thing is that the family's issues um, are, are, are they're not being heard, they're not being addressed. What we found out is that if even attorneys who knew how to navigate the family law system were not able to access the family law system to get family law orders in place for these, uh, these children, within the Department of Child Safety's required timelines, the Department of Child Safety had to act before you could get a hearing downtown. Sometimes it would take as long as a month or two months to get a hearing before the family law judge where we could take care of it in one day. Um, DAP was able to uh, give an access to justice for these families, be able to give them um, uh, the ability to break down the silo system and assisted the self-represented litigants um, with the system through the DAP process. As we noted in the previous slides about the DAP program, these cases, before we had the DAP program, these cases were in our system for at least 141 days. In talking with the parents, we were able to, uh, in talking with the attorneys, we were able to get the perspectives from the parents and the families, as well as the children. Parents and families going through a dependency find themselves subjected to an involuntary process that disempowers them 
when making decisions regarding their child's welfare. Even the children, um, from their perspective, 141 days is a very long time, and suddenly they're placed outside their homes, maybe their siblings are separated from them, and just in general, their normal activities and routines are disrupted. With the DAP program, we were, um, in, in the shortening of the time frame for these cases, we received comments from participants in our survey, such as, the quickness of the paperwork helps me because I am military. I can't return to court multiple times, definitely keep this program. It helps families deal with less stress and not getting DCS involved if not needed. Another participant stated, really liked the way the mediator and lawyer assisted and kept things as positive as they could. Children also going through the process voiced their opinions, just like Judge Quigley talked about that one young man, this might have been his comment, I feel that the most helpful thing was that I didn't get put in a foster home. Another comment was, everyone was very helpful considering my situation and my age. And through the system's eyes, it's not only the court, but all of the partners that we've worked with. Um, this is more than just a differentiated case management approach where you would send one case this route and other cases a different route for different types of hearings. It really is a program and a system change that we relied on all of our partners. So it took judicial leadership, but it took the partnership of everyone working with us um, to develop this. And for the court, we really had overlapping with our goals, underlying interests to protect the children, to empower families to make decision making, um, and promote access to justice. Not only access to justice for those cases going through DAP, um, you know, coming from 141 days and all of that process to seven days, but also thinking about the big picture and the impacts on the all of the other cases uh, that we have for dependencies and other things at juvenile court. Because for every case that goes through DAP and has a positive resolution that we can meet our two goals, that means that there is more time, resources, uh, court availability that can be focused on those cases that truly need the attorneys, mediators, and judge time to protect those children in, in that way. Uh, we also looked at being responsible stewards of finite public resources. And so you might be thinking, well, this is a great idea and I'm really excited but how do I go back to my court and ask for resources and ask for money and come up with a budget to roll something out like this? We actually, because they were cases and we weren't expanding the net, cases already coming through our system, we were able to quantify what do we already spend on those cases and reallocate those resources uh, to the DAP program. So we started with absolutely no budget and just talking to our partners to kind of help them see it in the same way that you would be reallocating your staff time, the money spent, the resources spent, the expertise spent um, to partner with us in creating and implementing this program. Over time, it's become so established that we were able to look within our budget and we have about a half position dedicated to coordinating the program because, um, again, because of the volume now that we have in the cases. Uh, even looking to paying for attorneys, we were able to go to our public defense services and they were able to look at uh, the, the way that it made sense to allocate time and we, are, we do contract with some attorneys and use some in-house attorneys. Um, but again, it's, it's ultimately significantly cost savings. And so also it's less reports, um, less meetings, less court hearings, so that those overburdened caseloads that all of the professionals from uh, case manager to attorney to mediator to judicial officer have reduced that they can spend on the other cases. And through the system's eyes, as, as a judge, um, as, as you all know, that a lot of times a, a family, a parent will come into the system through the dependency and they'll be forced into the system and they are not ready to become sober. They're not ready 
uh, to deal with the issues and go through education. Or the parent has such significant mental health issues that they really are not able to care for their child. Those cases oftentimes result in a severance and then adoption of the children by a parent, grandparent, or relative. What DAP recognized is that if a family is willing to agree on a safe and appropriate uh, order for that child to be in somebody else's care that we can facilitate, then that allows the parent the opportunity to try to heal themselves, work on themselves and maintain a relationship that the children are protected and they're safe. That saves time in the court system. When you take cases out of the court system where you can resolve them through the DAP program, then that gives more time for the judge and the attorneys and the clerk's court and the court reporters to be able to focus on the cases that really need the reunification process or other process that the court has to offer. And I think this has been a really valuable opportunity for families. I had a mom come into court one day when I was doing a DAP hearing and she walked in and said, no, absolutely not. You are not doing this. Uh, to my children, you are not doing these orders. And I told her, you're absolutely right. We had just put temporary orders in place. And I said, you're right. This has to be something that you agree with. I said, I will set this next week. You'll come back, you'll meet with the mediator and our team. She came back in the next week and she came into the court with a big smile on her face and said, this is the best program ever. So now we're going to talk a little bit about um, just how we developed the program and the actual process of the program. We wanted you to get a sense of what, um, what the program kind of is overarching before we del delve into the nuts and bolts. So one of the first things we did was um, you start with your partners. Um, we're very fortunate here in Pima County. We have been a model court for years. So our stakeholders are already at the table. They're willing to discuss new ideas and inventive ideas. And But in case you might be starting from scratch, we do have a few tips for you. Having a strong judicial leadership is obviously very important. And you see that we've had Judge Quigley at the helm for this project since the beginning. She recognized the great ideas and opportunities that the attorneys had brought forth um, when, when it actually started. And she, she gathered the right people at the table, you know, asking that question, who do we need here to, in order to get this done? Once your stakeholders have been identified, it's important that you, you really have folks who are collaborative, flexible, and open-mindedness, open-minded. And we understand that this is not always possible. But um, once you get people at the table, um, as, as the leaders of the, ta of the court, um, trying to steer the discussions away from all the reasons you can't do a program and keeping it more focused on what you can accomplish um, just within your means. You know, Stacy mentioned budget. We did it without um, advancing our budget. And um, it, it really took everybody at that table um, moving, moving your group forward. Um, but we also recognize that there are times where um, agencies will have boundaries, and again, it's just working within the boundaries of those organizations. Once you have your partners up and you start developing and then finally implementing, it really becomes a matter of continuous process improvement. Um, we did go through a forming, storming, norming, and performing um, because after five years, you know, midway, we did find that there was some turnover and we kind of had to come back to the table, get everybody on the same page, regroup, and move forward. So this is a, how DAP works. Um, so for those cases, again, we're looking at the cases that would have come through the dependency process already. So we developed several referral sources. The first is the Child Welfare Agency. In our jurisdiction, it's called the Department of Child Safety. And so with working with them, they looked at coming up with their own criteria about what kind of cases would fall in those situations um, that Judge Quigley mentioned earlier. And they came up with, at first, a very finite decision tree, um, kind of a decision-making guide that their staff used. They do staff it with their supervisor and they have what's called a team decision-making meeting. So they come together with the family, the department, and some professionals to talk about whether this should be a dependency case, 
whether this should go to DAP or other alternatives to keep the children safe. Um, and at the end of that team decision-making meeting is where everyone comes to a resolution to go to the dependency alternative program. It is nice that it goes through that process because what we found is when they come to the day of DAP, both the department and the family have already had some conversations, have an idea of how they wanna move forward. Uh, and a big thing I wanna stress is that we do this um, for the department refers directly to our court staff and we have an intake process with various questions that we do that before filing a dependency petition. I really encourage you to adopt that same process um, because once you file that dependency petition, at least in Arizona, it triggers some legal requirements and statutes but regarding timeframes, regarding reports that have to be done, regarding attorneys that have to be appointed. And so we, they can refer directly to us, to our DAP coordinator, which even before we had that position, we just looked at staff that were doing intake processes and had them um, do this for this program. Um, so that then they can go to the dependency alternative program. They can still go the, the dependency route if needed, but we don't have those requirements of those timelines um, and it's a very simple referral form for the department. So that's a big thing for them. We are maybe unique in Arizona. Not all jurisdictions have what's called private dependencies, which means a citizen other than the official child welfare agency can file a dependency action. So anyone who has a vested interest in the safety of a child, often this is a grandparent, an aunt and uncle, as Judge Quigley mentioned, maybe a caretaker or kinship who's caring for the child who can file those private dependencies. Those are filed and then screened by court staff for the criteria, which is very basic, to see if it would qualify within our goals and the parameters of our program. If that is the case, then modified temporary orders are issued so that the children are safe from the time of that filing to that DAP referral, which is usually less than a week before they get in the hearing. But that means there's not a gap in caring for the children. And then they come to DAP. We have a third kind of way you can come into the program as well. Um, mostly maybe guardian ad litems and delinquency cases. And one of our partners works with um, kinship and family caregivers who may refer directly. This has been a minority of our referrals. And you can see in one of our handouts that we do break down the referrals to DCS and non-DCS referrals. So you can get an idea of the quantity of what kind of comes through our doors year by year as we've grown. And again, just to stress, we're not supplanting um, legal clinics, family law legal clinics or services. We're not supplanting other community services, we're really honing in on those cases that would have already come through our courthouse doors and our process and using that differentiated case management process. So once our court staff goes through this referral, they put together some basic information, make sure that we find all the parents um, and the interested parties to come. They do the scheduling and all of that case management logistics that you would do for, for any kind of case, but in a different way here. And so um, then they provide that information to everyone who will be at the hearing. If you want to go to the next slide. We found over time, we didn't start with looking at the Indian Child Welfare Act, but one of our learning lessons we want to share with you is how important it is to integrate that into any kind of program that you have where it may be applicable. And so you have in your handouts our kind of analysis memo, the language we use, and some really relevant documents that we wanted to share with you. We found that's really important. And so every time we're screening for the Indian Child Welfare Act as well. And so once we have a referral, our coordinator puts together a very basic intake sheet and that sends it out in advance. It could be up to the end of the day on Wednesday for a Friday DAP. We have our DAP set in blocks so that it's Friday morning from 8.30 in the morning to noon or afternoon 1.30 to 5 p.m. And we've expanded over time 
where we also provide it Wednesday afternoons. Um, but what day of DAP looks like is in advance, the coordinator will send the information to the advisory council, the judge, the department if they're involved, the mediator in the case, and any other professionals that may be there so that they can prepare for the case. And the advisory council really does, we've learned over time, that pre preparation in advance makes a difference. So they get that case, they maybe look at some legal analysis on the case, make sure jurisdiction is okay, we don't have any venue issues, and they start to engage the family right away which was really important we found. And so they'll reach out to the family in advance and start to talk to them about what is DAP? What does a dependency look like? What do the alternatives look like? Starting to prepare them for the DAP session, which helps things move along in the expedious way that they're going to move along. And then you get to the day of DAP. So the day of DAP, we welcome everyone. And the first thing they do is they meet with that advisory council. When I say advisory council, there's no attorney-client relationship, and it's one advisory council, one attorney, for all of the family or kinship that is there. And their role is to advise on the legal options, explain the process, answer legal questions, fill out all of that legal paperwork, because sometimes it can be quite intensive, and you have to balance that role of the judge, the role of the mediator, um, so we aren't getting in a situation where judges are having to reject paperwork because the paperwork's not done correctly. Um, and then about 80 to 90 percent of our cases go to a mediation. And mediation is a very important component um, where we have professional court mediators who are able to work with all of the professionals and family to participate in a confidential mediation to negotiate the resolution. And this again goes to the tenets of our program, which is a voluntary self-determined program. And it also goes to the fact that you don't have to find cases that everyone is 100% on the same page from the very beginning. As Judge Quigley pointed out, you could have a mom who at first kind of has a reaction like, no, this is not gonna work for me. I don't agree to that. Where they come in and they work with advisory counsel um, so they get the information and they work with media mediators who are trained and skilled to help with conflict resolution. And between all of those professionals help with coming up with a knowing, intelligent, voluntary decision. So they, most of them go to mediation. Sometimes they mediate whether they want to go to a dependency or not. Um, sometimes it's very a uh, clear scope of mediation where they know that they want to resolve in a parenting plan and we just need to mediate the actual parenting plan. Sometimes the advisory council are able to talk to the family in advance and everybody's already so much on the same page that the advisory council doesn't ask for the mediation because they can already have the paperwork prepared and move forward. I want to point out that the day of DAP, I talked about those blocks. In, all of the flexibility that we've had with this program, we also have flexibility on that day. So we don't have a certain time where this is the appointment time of the attorney and this is the appointment time of the mediation and this is when you have to be in the hearing or otherwise you can't proceed. We're very fluid and adaptable during that time. So if it takes more or less time for any one of those steps, we give that very case specific family-centric um, process. So the judge is actually on call. Um, so when we're ready and if we use a hearing, they're kind of ready to come down to the courtroom from chambers uh, when we're needed. So if a full agreement is reached, whether that's through mediation or not, then the attorney then assists with preparing all of the legal documents, which oftentimes is filing a brand new court case to start a guardianship or a parenting plan. And for us, one of the big things is the clerk's office actually had to significantly modify their procedures because we have the two diff different campuses for our courthouse. Um, they had to rework things to accommodate DAP so that we can actually file a case, get a case number, and get them into a uh, hearing within um, one morning or one afternoon. And so if they go on to the hearing, um, 
that means that the uh, uh, agreement has been reached. So the hearing is not intended to have any kind of contested matter, any kind of evidence um, or things presented where the, the judge is deciding um, between the sides. We only present to the hearing if there's a full agreement reached on the resolution. The advisory council functions as a friend of the court and will ask all of the questions of the witnesses and make sure that all of the elements required to move forward with that hearing um, are satisfied. We have a clerk of the court and a judge there as well. Um, and in private dependency, so again, I said the Department of Child Safety, there's no dependency case filed. We're pre-filing, um, doing basically a diversion program in addition to differentiated case management. But in the private petitions where there does exist a uh, dependency case number and the full agreements reached for a different legal resolution, the petitioner will move to withdraw the petition and close out that case. If for any reason there is no agreement for an alternative legal resolution, the parties proceed to a dependency case. Um, and that'll either be because there's already an open case in the private dependency, just setting the next hearing and modifying those temporary orders, or for the department going back and filing a petition and starting a case. Sometimes we have room for return hearings, sometimes because we've moved so quickly, we haven't found a parent. And so we may have return hearings or return mediation sessions to properly serve and find those parents. But in the meantime, there's temporary orders. And then in other situations, there's final orders. And again, in one of our handouts, we kind of break down what are those outcomes. So just briefly, I want to go over the outcomes. And again, different jurisdictions may have um, different um, options for what your legal outcomes will look like. For Arizona, it's a parenting plan. So that's between the parents talking about legal decision making and parenting time. As Judge Quigley said, sometimes there's only one parent that is safe and the other parent isn't. So if they never had a parenting plan or need to modify it, we can do that. In loco parentis or third party decision making is an option here. And that's through our family law statutes. Uh, one restriction there for us is parents have to be legally separated, divorced or never married. So sometimes we, we can't go that route even if people want to, if the parents are still married. Guardianship is through our probate court, which is a kind of a, it's a consensual guardianship that can be established for, for a third part non-parents to care for children. Um, and for that, the parents can go back to court and ask for it to be, or the, the petitioner as well, uh, to be dissolved and changed in the future. Successor guardianships are under our dependency laws where there's already been a permanent guardianship in place following a full-blown dependency case. And sometimes for certain reasons, um, the guardian can no longer care for the child. And so we make this a much easier process than the regular route for families to, to choose their successor guardian. It, in some cases, and it's been a minority of cases and didn't happen until a few years in uh, for the private dependencies, there's been a situation where it's as simple as a, setting up a power of attorney because it's a very temporary situation that we need to create a safe and stable situation for the children. And then again, if there's no agreement to a al legal alternative, the parties may proceed to a dependency. I do want to say that we're very careful not to say those are failures of the DAP program. We consider every case that goes through a success. You'd be surprised that actually quite a few cases um, actually after getting that information from the advisory council, going through the mediation process, talking with the department, that um, they decide they would prefer to proceed to a dependency. And, and that's made knowingly and intelligently uh, because either the proposed caretaker realizes what that means for these other legal alternatives and maybe says I'm not in a place to make that commitment to the children in the family or maybe a parent through that process 
learns about the alternatives versus a dependency and says, you know what, I really do want to work that full-blown reunification plan. So that's the best option for us. Um, and then a minority of cases actually is where they just absolutely cannot come to an agreement. And because of that, they default to going to a dependency case. Uh, for those private dependencies, I do want to say that we screen for any department involvement so that we don't accidentally um, kind of step over two systems. And I also want to say it's important on the day of DAP that you have all of the relevant people to make those decisions and the decision makers. So if it's a DCS involved referral, they are there with their attorney um, and they are decision makers there. So they don't have to go back and staff a different day if a new alternative comes up. They have someone available who can be agile to make those decisions on the day of DAP. To give you an idea of the outcomes, uh, overall in loco parentis or those third party rights have been about 42% of the overall outcomes over the period of our program, followed closely by legal decision making. The first half of our program um, couple years, it was flip-flopped, and since then, in loco parentis has shown to be more preferred, followed by guardianship. Uh, the department, except for a few exceptions, um, does not usually resolve cases for guardianship for a couple reasons, and followed by some other ones. So you can see um, just the different things, and even there's something called a DCS voluntary where they're not going full-blown dependency, but they're going to do some in-home services for 90 days with the department. Okay, so let's talk about how we track our cases. Oops. Got ahead of myself. So we... Um, we know that oftentimes you, you institute a program and then after time it just kind of fades away, but we really built in some checks to ensure we stayed on track. Um, those participant surveys really kind of gave us, a, um, we, we hold them at the conclusion of the proceedings. We've done them all five years and that information is really helpful. Um, are, are we are doing what we said we're going to do? Um, are we giving the people um, what they need? Um, everybody coming to the court and we can then kind of modify the program um, so we consistently evaluate our what we're doing um, we also track the case outcomes and we flag the legal file to keep um, track of the case when it moves downtown so that the downtown judges know that this was a DAP case in case that issue comes up and also DCS reviews to determine if there's been any further contact with this family so one of the other checks comes from our DAP committee meetings, and um, we really determine whether if any program changes need to occur. We keep everyone up to date, and we also really celebrate the work that goes on within the program. Um, you know, when we started, these meetings were weekly, then monthly, then quarterly, and then again, yearly, we celebrate with a pizza party, but those aren't for hold for right now. Um, but really those meetings do kind of steer steer the ship and it's the data that we look at um, that helps um, help us understand where we're going, where trends might be occurring. And when the numbers do kind of dip, um, we say, okay, well, what is that in relationship to? But we're consistently meeting to make sure that we're looking at that. So I want to just share a little bit of our numbers. Um, and if these numbers, if that trajectory had um, continued around 2016, we would have seen the highest um, number of cases of petitions. But through our DAP program, we were able to, to lower them. But again, you see some kind of the ups and downs. Um, a lot of the, um, the numbers, when we started taking up between 2018 and 2019, there was a lot of turnover and staff, not only at the court, but through the other agencies as well. So ultimately, you know, our primary goal of the program was to move these cases to resolve them quickly, but also with the safest, 
safest outcome for the children, which we've mentioned before. Um, but a secondary goal was to assist families so that they stayed out of the system for a year. We did meet that goal after tracking cases um, at that first year mark. Um, we're per process, currently in the process of evaluating all of our DAP cases to get that larger picture. Um, and, and again, this, this first year evaluation we were able to do, um, but it is difficult. It is, it's a time consuming process. Uh, it's all manual. None of the, these cases are um, really identified in our case management system. So it, it's a lot of hand counting. So it's very involved to, to track these cases. So you'll also see that we were able to handle 260 cases, but that involved 384 children. So of these cases that were referred, and Stacy mentioned that, that some of them don't actually end up going through our program. And some of them were dismissed within a few months and others actually made that decision not to go through DAP. That is definitely what we consider a success because the, the parents were given that empowerment to make that determination on their own. And not to, not to belittle it, we, we talked a lot about what Judge Quigley mentioned, the, the cost of, of, that we're saving. Um, that $1 million is a conservative estimate, um, very conservative. And um, we know that it's probably more, but um, it, it's it's a lot of moving pieces to track budget wise because it's not just our agencies it's across attorneys DCS the clerk's office so once our program was up and running we did send it to our Arizona Supreme Court and we did receive the 2017 Strategic Plan Award for Protecting Children, Families, and Communities. Um, we were really proud of this fact, um, but even more so, Justice Brutonell took a notice of it, and he um, included it in his, um, his own strategic plan for Arizona courts in general. So one of the things that we're, we've been doing is um, helping other counties since it's in the ju justices um, strategic plan, we're helping other counties roll out DAP in their, in their areas. And so we've been doing a lot of, um, well, we haven't been doing site visits anymore, but we've been doing a lot of uh, meetings virtually with different courts. And we've are also identified that, uh, ways to expand our own program, and we're calling that DAPX. Um, Stacy mentioned we're holding extra DAP sessions and we're now looking at um, other forms of pre-petition deferrals. So with that, I want to really thank you all for coming to our presentation. Um, if you have any questions that were not answered during the presentation, feel free to reach out to us. Um, this slideshow will be posted to the NACOM website along with the, the handouts that we mentioned. And again, if you have any further questions, we'd be happy to answer them. So thank you very much.